And then um, I had to... A cyclone was traditionally, if you read the book, textbooks, only good down to about 20 microns. Well, a huge amount of house dust is about half a micron. So I had to really improve the efficiency of a cyclone. I had to improve the state of the art of cyclones. And again, I just did that empirically, just building prototype after prototype after prototype, discovering what made things worse and what made them better in a really Edisonian fashion. But um, the big breakthrough was learning how to separate hair and um, strands of cotton and fluff. Interesting objects. <laughs> real customers beyond 150 testers that you have in Malaysia uh, to get feedback on improving your Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, by talking to people, um, we do do focus groups. We do all that sort of thing. And it is interesting, but you mustn't be ruled by it. That was really my point. Um, you know, they'll, they'll give you your opinion, but they won't tell you the future. Uh, you have to guess at that, thank goodness. I mean, it would be, life would be incredibly boring if you could go out and do research and discover what to do. So they're inter it's very interesting to get people's opinions. And people write in letters of complaint. Those are really interesting. I read all of those. And, you know, they bother to sit down and write a letter telling you what's wrong with your product. And it's gold dust. You know, that's what tell it tells you how to improve it or it gives you a good idea how to improve it. Mm. So you... you um you must have an environment of creativity. You must encourage a lot of creativity among your employees. Mm. Um, how do you codify that to 400 people in three countries throughout your organization? Uh, well, we were, we're actually only in two countries where, where the creativity is taking place, in Malaysia and Britain. Um, although we have a research group here and a research group in Japan. Uh, it's, um, in one sense, it's difficult, and in one sense, it's easy. It's a very difficult question to answer that. And I don't think there's any magic formula. I don't think there are, there are rules that you can obey to do it. I think it's entirely the way you behave and the way you get the organization to behave. Um, I noticed quite early on that it was better to employ people straight from college because they weren't sullied by working at another company. So at first, every, everybody, and even now, almost all the engineers came straight from university. And we put them straight onto live projects. And uh, they were fantastic. I mean, it was, it was amazing. And so we, we've given them creative jobs to do, right, and the responsibility right from the beginning. I, I don't believe that, that experience is that important. And uh, so engendering that sort of feeling, that sort of enthusiasm in an organization, that it doesn't matter who you are or what your experience is, it's what you do what you create that's important. So it's, a, it's an everyday thing. It's your everyday reaction to what people say. It's your everyday reaction to ideas. You know, not being cynical when someone, in, in a group, or groups get together and someone makes a silly suggestion and everybody laughs at him. Actually, usually, the silly suggestion is the best suggestion of the year. You know, wrong thinking is the best way to start. Because everybody else starts by thinking the correct things. You start by thinking the wrong things, Although it doesn't work, it can set you off on a different path. And eventually you come to a solution that no one else would have thought of because they're all thinking correctly. So you know, it's stopping people being cynical and laughing at someone who makes a silly suggestion. For example, what someone in our helpline um, suggested putting the helpline number right on the top of the machine in very large letters. And everybody sniggered and said, if you do that, people go in the shop and say, oh, it's going to break down because you put the number right on the top. So we put the number right on the top. And no one sniggered. And um, that meant that anyone using our machine, if anything went wrong or they wanted a spare part, they knew exactly where to find us. And um, our competitors have started copying it after a couple of years. So that kind of wrong thinking and, and just keeping people thinking laterally, thinking incorrectly, making mistakes, and encouraging that uh, is, I think, the way you keep creativity going. But there's no rules. I mean, you just, it's entirely the way you behave every day, I think. One more question. Um, you mentioned that uh, early on, you found that golden idea of sending high value goods in high numbers, rather than selling cheaply. 
speaking today by even our being in England and producing in Malaysia, we found golden combination of two, you know, social community that creates our value. And is that sustainable? Well, well, of course, lots of questions there. I mean, the, the, um, uh, the, I think the point I was making is that um, what I like doing is designing products where I'm not designing it down to a price. I'm doing what I think a vacuum cleaner should be, a washing machine should be, whatever it is. So, um, and that usually means it ends up being more expensive than people who design down to a price. Um, and the point I'm making, I made earlier was that you can... Uh, consumers actually, I think, see that it is good value, and you can get a very large market share. We have a 24% share of the American market at you know, $400 to $600, which is three times the price of everybody else. So we have the biggest market share, uh, and we sell by far the most expensive products. So you can do that. So you don't, don't always think you have to design down to a price in order to, get, to have a successful business. That was my first point. Um, your other point about um, does developing products in an expensive country where there's creativity and good engineers and making it in a cheap country, yes, that's the formula that works at the moment. I don't think it'll last for all sorts of reasons. I mean, China and India are outputting 20 times more engineers than there are being produced in the United States and Britain. So they're going to get the engineering and design skills, ultimately. Um, so we, we, we won't, at that, I doubt at that stage, whether we'll be able to go on developing products in expensive countries. 